Welcome, everybody, to The Human Perspective. Today, uh, we have the privilege of speaking with Vesper Moore. Vesper had invited me a number of months ago to be on their podcast, which is called Get Mad. And I really enjoyed doing it. And at the end of it, Kylie and I were discussing, well, let's see if we have an opportunity to invite Vesper onto our program. And so here we are today. So let's start off. I would like to give a description of myself. I have highlights in my hair. I'm wearing red glasses. And we've just had a discussion about the color of my blouse, which uh, Vesper thinks is teal. And I'm on Vesper's side and Kylie thinks is blue. So it's kind of a blue green or uh, teal. Anyway, um, Vesper, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to give us a description of yourself? Absolutely. I have shoulder length, uh, brown, black hair, and I am a brown, mixed race, Hispanic, indigenous person. Um, I'm wearing a black V-neck t-shirt uh, with a medallion of an ancestor on my necklace. I have um, brown, black facial hair, as well as glasses. So, um, Vesper, can you explain a little bit about the show that you're currently doing. Absolutely. So Get Mad with Vesper Moore really started from the space of being a psychiatric survivor, a mad person, and a disabled person, Um, because I'm I'm someone who has tachycardia and a few different um, heart conditions. I I really grew uh, an appreciation for um, this this idea of the, the the social model of disability and really saw that there was this almost like a disconnection between the wider psychiatric survivor movement and the disability rights movement. being part of both of these spaces. I was like, wouldn't it be great to have a podcast that's, se- that's centered around celebrating identities as they relate to mental health and otherwise, more particularly as a way of subverting and defying the paradigm of mental health when we talk about like oh what does it mean to to have an experience where you are hearing voices or experiencing another state of mind what is it like when people think that you are too unstable and dangerous to function in society because I think when we talk about um, the identity of uh, folks with mental health conditions, psychosocial disabilities, something that is often missed is this idea that um, the context of disability rights is different because there's an inherent perception of danger with the person. So the Get Mad podcast was really as a means of how do we explore the difference and similarities of a lot of these experiences. How do we talk about the need for uh, for system reform or conversations around abolition or critical conversations um, around celebrating identity um, and also civil rights in the context of mental health? Because often mental health ends up siloed in this idea of care. Um, and the care is extremely important and the healthcare system is extremely important in that context, but we don't talk enough about the rights of, of folks because the disability is invisible, right? And is often left out of the conversation. So this podcast was a means of building that bridge, uh, I think, between mental health adv- activism and mental health liberation in so many contexts with other social justice movements. You know, I um, started to become more knowledgeable about the psychiatric survivor movement really in the 1970s. Um, The audience knows that I grew up in Brooklyn and I was there till I was about 25, then went out to Berkeley getting involved with the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, which established as one of its precepts wanting to become a cross-disability organization. And uh, I was lucky in those years to start meeting a number of people, gentlemen by the name of Howie the Harp, who uh, was a psychiatric survivor and also had a physical disability and was highly respected in the Berkeley community, but also 
nationally and a wonderful woman, Sally Zinman, who um, also worked in the psychiatric survivor movement, set up a great organization that was a support center for um, people who were defining themselves as psychiatric survivors, and Judy Chamberlain, who was um, both a psychiatric survivor, but also um, a leader in the national movement, strengthening the voices of people um, who were psychiatric survivors, but also involved in research and doing some very good work, uh, working with the community as well as professionals. What was very important to me in listening to what you were just saying is, you know, the recognition that many of us didn't know people who were psychiatric survivors. So it was very important to be expanding the disability rights movement to be inclusive of all. So really linking up with this community has been very important. You talk about your disability and being a psychiatric survivor. How do you identify yourself? Are you a psychiatric survivor with a disability? Are you a disabled person who is a psychiatric survivor? Do you think about that at all? Mm. Yeah, it's it it's been an interesting journey for me because um I am an autistic person. And the 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 thing is is that I had always known it as a person with autism when talking about my experience more more widely and being a brown autistic person uh being perceived as violent when I was younger and really the the intersection of those two experiences, right? But um, later receiving psychiatric diagnoses like schizoaffective disorder, uh, being put on risperidone and, 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 and a lot of these, these different experiences, I really went into, uh, disability rights organizing through the psychiatric survivor movement before identifying as a psychiatric survivor. I first identified as a person with mental illness. And I think something that is, uh, so so uh, controversial and important about the statement of identifying as mentally ill or with mental illness is that people can identify with mental illness. It's super important, you know, for people to have that freedom of identity. Um, and then there are other people who recognize that the label, you know, deeming people the mentally ill, getting the mentally ill off the street has been um, used as a way to really uh, re- refer, minimize, and erase uh, a lot of our experiences. So later on in life, I was like, okay, I identify as a psychiatric survivor, but what does that mean for like the actual experiences that, that, you know, can be emotionally distressing, but like also beautiful at times where I might think of things uh, outside of the box. Like I'm an artist. I do a lot of drawing, sculpting, photography, and a lot of that creativity, I think, you know, is very much related to um, my, my disorders. So a big part of that too was like, okay, so how do I identify with that? And then later I learned about mad pride. Um, which was something, uh, you know, Judy was was really great about uplifting as well as Howie. Judy Chamberlain, yeah. Yeah, Ju- Judy Chamberlain, yes. Um, and and, and I, I think an important part of, of Mad Pride is the idea of celebrating states of mind, celebrating states of being. Um, and, and, you know, kind of stepping away from this idea that there is a conventional state of mind, state of body, right? Or that there is something wrong with us, you know, inherently getting away from those ideas and rather focusing on society needs to be both accessible to us, but also uh, foster and appreciate, you know, us as well um, and, and the beauty of, of, of who we are. So I think partly you've been discussing uh, issues around stigma and the impact of stigma on uh, disability community overall. But in this area, it was like people who identify as uh, psychiatric survivors. How has stigma impacted you? And uh, how do you, both as an individual and then in a broader context, work on uh, reducing stigma? Absolutely. I mean, I think for me, there's there's stigma and 
discrimination. And we see a lot of that discrimination now arising in New York and California with street sweeps and, uh, you know, uh, people with, with mental health diagnoses. And I think when I, when I talk about how it's impacted me in my life, um, I immediately think of my schizoaffective diagnosis, more particularly because uh, black and brown people are four to five times more likely in the United States to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than white people are. And when, when I talk about that experience of being a, a brown person diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, the way in which um, I was treated and the way in which my my diagnosis followed me into different spaces, a very important part of my story. I had an experience where I was attacked by someone and, and it, it, was, it was a near-death experience. Um, I, I, I was stabbed. And that experience in particular, it was, it was less the traumatic experience that had happened to me as a teenager at that time um, and it was more the experience of how my family reacted, how my providers reacted, how when I was um, at a hospital, you know, in, in central Massachusetts, receiving treatment that my family was talking about me, literally without me. They, they surrounded me and they were like, what are we going to do with Vesper? Where is Vesper going to live? I feel like we, we've exhausted all of our, our options in terms of mental health supports and, and what Vesper needs, you know? So the, the difficulty of that experience, I think, is, is something that's so important. It's the fact that more often than not, when we see this, this um, unknowing discrimination or the discrimination of the well-meaning, it, it, it really erupts with, okay, you can't help yourself, so let me help you. So the you incident know. that you're discussing was a random incident? Yes, it was a random incident. So did people believe that you had something to do with the incident? Discussing with police the details of what happened, because with circumstances like this, you do have to talk to police. And when talking to the police officers, they were trying to, hint or try to get the information of, did you do this to yourself? Uh, we notice you have a history of suicide. Did you do this to yourself? Um, and it was a complicated situation really because I didn't do it to myself and trying to prove it to police was a really, really hard circumstance, yeah. Would you say that stigma uh, significantly impedes people's uh, willingness to discuss such things as depression, anxiety, bipolar, other psychosocial disabilities, which are normal parts of their lives and need to be discussed. And do you do any work on that area of helping people to disclose? Absolutely. I think a big part of that work has been, first off, somewhat, you know, supporting people and realizing how in which they are being thought of or treated differently because of their diagnosis or because of their history of mental health. I think it's, it's hard for folks to get there because I think people often assume there's something wrong with me. I am, I am, you know, not well, I messed up. Like people think in that context pretty frequently when I support them or, or, or advocate with them. And I think one of the things that's, that, that's difficult about that is, is that, is that there's almost an unlearning about needing to, to, to understand how in which society thinks about people with mental health conditions and, and how we are labeled and thought of and how even our own family, you know, people, people that we love and hold dearly might think of us as different as well. Um, in the context of depression and anxiety, I think it's an assumed fragility, right? People assume that you're too fragile to, to handle this piece of information. Maybe it's, it's uh, you know, your parents are divorcing and, oh, you're, you're too fragile to handle that information. I have to think about how to talk to you about this. I have to think about how to, how to work with this. And it, it changes the level of authenticity and um, the nature of, of, of your relationship with the person because 
because of that assumption of fragility, danger, and being unable. Do you find that the whole concept of peer support, you know, one people with similar disabilities being able to support each other, has that been valuable for you? Yeah, it's actually, for me, it's, it's how I became involved with, uh, with, with the psychiatric survivor movement was through peer support. You know, I was aware of the disability rights movement um, and, and, and pretty knowledgeable of it because I think, I think even though less mainstream notoriety, you see the disability rights movement in a lot of different contexts, you know, in, in our wider society. Whereas with the, the, the psychiatric survivor movement, you know, even speaking out that you've survived something as a result of the psychiatric system or the mental health industrial complex is a, is a controversial statement. It, it wasn't until being involved in peer support where, where I learned about, you know, the different ideas of being a change agent, being in but not of the system, um, supporting your community first, supporting each other, right? Those are the roles of peer support and peer support community. But what I think what was, was so important is, is seeing uh, crisis alternatives as well through, through peer support, such as peer respite and uh, peer support lines. What is peer respite? Peer respite is a 24-7 uh, crisis alternative to hospitalization. Um, it is uh, a house. Uh, more often than not, that is staffed by pe people in peer support roles, disabled people, mad people, psychiatric survivors, right? And supporting each other. The person, the people who come in manage their own medication. They stay as long as they would like. Generally, it's five to seven days, sometimes up to 30 in some special circumstances. I, I oversee two peer respites in Massachusetts, one named Kariah Peer Respite and one named Juniper Peer Respite. And those resources are, are, are invaluable, you know, in, in terms of us supporting each other and getting the work done, because that's an important piece, community care. How are these uh, organizations supported financially? I mean, sometimes they're funded by the state, sometimes they're, they're funded through Medicaid, sometimes they're funded through um, foundations and grants and um, crowdfunding sources, but there isn't, I, I find like just a singular source of funding that is like, okay, these organizations are, um, or these initiatives are earmarked for funding, for consistent funding, you know? So I think that that's an important piece as well. Um, it, it would be great to see more initiatives with, uh, with those of us who are most impacted taking the leadership from the inception, the design, the creation and the continuing community work. Maybe we could talk a little bit about what you see as the value of these programs versus uh, psychiatric institutions. Mm, that's that's very important. I mean, when going into a psychiatric institution, um, when being involuntary and voluntarily committed, there is a obvious history of warehousing and disappearing people. You know, that's a very important thing that I think we know about. And right now. Um, we see a trend of what I like to call reinstitutionalization happening across the country. Um, the consumer survivor ex patient ex inmate movement emerged from deinstitutionalization and the ways that it did um, and led to the creation of peer support in the mental health system and in other systems, right? And within the community. Mm -hmm. So some of the benefits of these, these approaches is, is, is one, um, being entirely staffed by disabled people, by mad people, by psychiatric survivors, trauma survivors. I think the, the other benefits as well is that people really take charge about what they want for themselves. More often than not, when someone's going into a resource like a peer respite, they recommends themselves. They're not referred by a provider or by someone else, but rather they've, they've decided they've understood that this resource would be great for them while they're going, having a really hard time. You know, I think another, another piece as well is, is that when, when someone does go into a psych institution, you can have your medication adjusted, 
You have treatment team meetings where your family and providers uh, make a lot of decisions for you, you know, whereas, whereas the, the primary tenet of these environments is self-determination, being person created as well as person centered. You're doing work with the Bazelon Center. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. So the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law is a law center that does some incredible, incredible great work. Group. My work with Bazelon more often than not has been building uh, coalitions and networks of, of psychiatric survivors um, and disabled folks to work together and collaborate and fight against a lot of uh, these pervasive initiatives that have been emerging. Um, more particularly recently, uh, myself and the and the Bazelon team, we we wrote a, a letter, um, really, really speaking out against Mayor Eric Adams' mental health directive in New York City. And and Judy, you and I were a part of a national coalition um, fighting against some of the things that are happening right now with HHC. To, to Levski and that case that has emerged from out of Indiana and was recently presented to the Supreme Court. So, I mean, you, you have one case that challenges uh, the right of disabled people to sue Medicaid funded organizations and um, sue based on what has happened in terms of a violation of our rights. Individual um, rights. Individual rights. And you, you also have another circumstance that seeks to institutionalize unhoused people on the streets that doesn't look too different from, you know, ugly laws and yeah. having disabled people hide themselves from, from, from the public view, having unhoused people who are deemed unsightly stay away from the public view, you know, um, this is uh, it's it, it, it's a repetition in a lot of ways. So so my work with Bazelon has been widely advocacy, fighting a lot of these issues across the country. Are there people in the psychiatric community, uh, healthcare providers, etc., that um, the Mad Movement uh, psychiatric survivors work with? Yeah, yeah. There's. There are a lot of different organizations that I think uh, work with and support a lot of these, these initiatives. I think the level of public support varies depending on whether, whether or not the organization um, feels that the issue that we might be challenging might, might not be one that they want to be challenging, right? Because sometimes, uh, you know, more often than not, some of this advocacy can involve um, pharmaceutical industries, uh, private companies, uh, um, you know, uh, states that, that, that might be funding some of these initiatives. So, so, so there's a lot of challenges along the way. But with that being said, there's a lot of provider agencies, law centers, advocacy um, organizations, uh, peer support organizations, um, independent living centers, and, and medical providers that, that do support and sign on to these initiatives. Most notably, I think there are uh, different chapters of different organizations, because when we look at um, the mental health directive in New York um, and what's happening there, you know, NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, Metro New York City, they've been doing a lot of great work um, in, in, in organizing some of these rallies um, along with communities for police reform and the uh, New York Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association. So, so all of these, these organizations are doing this work collaboratively and together in addition to being provider organizations and doing the great work there. When we look at California, you have organizations like Disability Rights California that has been fighting the issue of the care court, which is a very similar to the mental health directive that has happened in New York. The care court is more specifically Governor Newsom and um, having unhoused people, you know, being involuntarily committed. Um, it's it's it, it, it's a similar trend. I think what's clearly um, evolving is that the work in the disability community, psychiatric survivor community, et cetera, people are really, at least some people 
are really recognizing the importance of community-based supports and the harmfulness that can go on in institutions, many of which, you know, we've seen the catastrophes of what has happened to people. So for me, it's discouraging to see what mayors and other government officials are attempting to do because of the failure to provide appropriate housing and other supports to look at getting people off the street and putting them in a situation which for many could be quite detrimental. And really I think gives completely the wrong message to our societies about what we need to be doing to help ensure that people can be living in the community in dignity. Um, were you ever involved in this psychiatric system? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, a, a part of my story is, is uh, you know, for, for four years, I was in and out of institutions in Massachusetts. I was inpatient at Worcester State Hospital for a period of time. I spent some time um, through through a few different UMass inpatient facilities and, 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 and many other spaces. And I think for me, what was particularly jarring at the time was that a lot of these um, services that 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 were supposed to help me really instead, you know, um, sought to keep me silent. I was labeled as non-compliant within my notes and, and 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 in a lot of spaces. And the reason why was often I would speak out for other folks um, who who were on the unit as well as myself. I think, you know, advocacy. Um, self-advocacy and advocating with others is really frowned upon in psychiatric inpatient units because you have that layer of discrimination, that perception of danger, that perception of like you're unable and the and the idea of social control that is inherent. Um, I think I think we we have to also look at the foundations of of psychiatric institutions historically. I mean, you have the, the Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians that, that institutionalized uh, 300 Native Americans and labeled them with diagnoses like horse stealing mania, simply for the pure fact of disappearing them and taking them away from their land. You have the Detroit riots and labeling black people with schizophrenia and then their notes reading that it was because of their involvement with the civil rights movement. So there's a caution here as well of like, it isn't just folks who are struggling with their mental health, whether or not you identify with that, not your, your, your struggle is tied. It is, it is tied. It is interconnected um, with ours. And the reason why is, is that, you very easily could be someone who's in, who's who's advocating for themselves, who's going through a lot in their life, and you can end up in in an institution and have your rights stripped away. How would you say the system is set up to assist someone who would like to be able to get some peer support to reach out to people who are having similar experiences? Uh, what do you advise them, and how do you reach them? Mm. It's an interesting thing uh, I find with with peer support, peer supporters um, in Massachusetts, they're called peer specialists and other states, sometimes they're called certified peer recovery specialists or otherwise. And some states have have taken to hiring peer specialists who are working in in state roles um, as state employees, as well as funding drop in centers and community initiatives that are led by peer supporters. But then you, you also see uh, peer supporters that, that come from different initiatives that are, that, that are community funded. You see peer supporters um, on integrated teams. If a peer support worker, for example, is on a team, how would that person know that that's their role? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, often, more often than not, the person would working in that role would introduce themselves as a peer support worker or another provider would identify them as a peer support worker. But the challenge with that as well is, is that sometimes the providers, the other providers on the team may not value the peer supporter as well. 
you know, on the team because of this inherent discrimination, this inherent stigma that we've been talking about, um, as well as, as, as not really seeing the value of the life experience and the life context. So they might not introduce that peer supporter as well. Um, in terms of how this is overseen, how this is regulated, that is different state to state, agency to agency. Yeah. Would you say there's a growing recognition of the importance of a role like this peer support worker? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the peer, peer supporters were, were recently um, mentioned in, in Biden's U unity agenda, as well as, you know, it's, it, it's been, it's been a, a top priority to, to, to ensure that, that all of these roles are, are able to be Medicaid funded. But one of the challenges as well with the Medicaid funding and peer supporters is, is that, is that a peer supporter might be in a position where they have to disclose a person's diagnosis um, in order to file a claim for them through through CMS. Yeah, yeah through Medicaid, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. I think an, another another piece as well that can be a challenge is, is uh, documentation, you know, um, documenting what, what people do. Are peer supporters put in a role where they're policing other mad disabled psychiatric survivors. And that is a conversation we are in right now as behavioral health expansion is huge across the United States. And I think it goes without saying the whole concept of peer support, uh, which I really started to get introduced to when we were creating, at least in the independent living movement in the 70s, was uh, disabled people, uh, many of whom had physical disabilities or other forms of disabilities in, and mental health uh, disabilities that may not have been being recognized and supported appropriately and how to help support people who had disabilities who were being peer support workers. Because for many of the peer support workers, they also needed to be getting some guidance and advice and how to work with people who were potentially in crisis and having other, you know, issues arising. Um, do you see this as something which is now more ingrained in the training for peer support workers of how to work with people uh, from an independent living community perspective? I think I think we're 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 starting to get there more. I. I think, you know, something that that happened, you know, when I really think about the consumer survivor ex patient ex inmate movement was, was that there was this idea of stepping away from a model that viewed us as deficit, primarily from for, from the mental health industrial complex and, and, and systems, there was an association of deficit with disability, that that I saw and, 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 and that I've come to recognize and it's like, the, the education of a social model of disability and understanding that society is inaccessible to us, right, and, and, and needs to become more accessible, as well as celebrate and honor our identities, to have pride in our identities, right? That's, those are conversations that I think are still, still emergent and still important, but I see them happening. So what are your dreams for the Mad Liberation Movement? Uh, what does it look like and feel like to you down the, down the road? I think my dream from the Mad Liberation Movement is that Mad Liberation isn't this thing that people are like, what is that? You know, what do you mean by that? You know, what do you mean you identify as a mad person? You know, uh, because for me, identifying as a mad person, the reason why I do is, is because people do perceive me as dangerous, as different already as a brown Hispanic person, you know, who has had police involvement, all sorts of things throughout their life. Um, so there's an inextricable link and a reclaiming that is happening. But what mad liberation means to me is, is freeing our minds um, from, from the incarcerating and punishing circumstances that, that we're, we're, we're trying to come to terms with. Uh, as a result of, of the mental health system, reinstitutionalization as we see it now, and institutionalization um, and warehousing of disabled people we've seen historically. So what I think about Mad Liberation is celebrating identity, but also us 
fighting more uh, for, for human rights in the context of, of mental health. Um, maybe not so much in the context of just treatment, but also fighting for, for, for the context of our identity and our personhood in society. And recognizing the strengths and contributions that people make on a daily basis. So we're getting to the end of our program, but I wanted to ask you another question. Okay. And that is, what do you do to have fun? <laughs> what brings you joy? Oh, I love this question. I love this question so much. I do a lot of different things for joy. I mean, I know it's weird, but like, I love, I love different types of food. I know that you call hot dogs, uh, Frankfurt's. Frankfurters. Frankfurters. Yeah. Frankfurters. <laughs> and <laughs> And, you know, like, so like exploring new and new types of food is a big part. I love, I love art. Like um, I am an artist at heart. So like I do a lot of drawing. I do a lot of writing. I do portraits of disability rights activists and psychiatric survivor activists, but also, you know, um, uh, throughout my life, I've, I've, I've done uh, comic book illustration and comic book inking, animation, all sorts of different stuff. Um, I, I like to spend time with my friends. I, I like to dance, even though I dance poorly. Um, <laughs> I love to play chess, you know, uh, when I can. So, yeah, those and are they some can ones. teach me. I'd love well, to. It's, it's been uh, great to talk with you. I'd also like to thank uh, Devin. So this is Devin Turk. And Devin is a student at Goucher. And he's doing work with Kylie and me uh, for the month of January. And one of his projects was to help us also identify people that he felt would be good to interview. And when he said Vesper, we're like, yeah, we've been thinking the same thing. So this is great. So thank you very much, Devin, for your work. Thank you so much, Judy. And thank you so much, Vesper. Or try to minimize our pain.